All right, what is going on, everybody? Thank you so much for joining yours truly, Ryan Kellager, on this week's episode of the Cut the Crap Show, where every single week I'm reading a book, and this book down is Core Golden Nuggets. I got a, got a lot of spit from this one. Kale, apple, mint, pineapple. It's a good juice, but man, that's tart. Anyways, you know what I'm doing here every single week. Just trying to save you a little bit of time, bring you some information that can spark change in your life, and I'm just trying to help you build resilience. I'm trying to help you create your eight every single week. And if you listen to this show, you're going to get a whole bunch of tools, different tactics, approaches to help you create your eight every single week. If you don't know what create your eight is, what's going on with you? Go to a previous episode of the Cut the Crap Show where I introduced create your eight to you. And maybe now it'll make a little bit more sense to you and how you can kind of use the show, use the content from the show to help you improve your mood, improve your level of happiness, help you beat depression, get over anxiety and help you get to your peak state every single day. All right, so I um, just want to say first off, again, this is the second time we've done this, uh, the video show, and I received a whole bunch of comments from people who have been longtime listeners, and one individual in particular messaged me and said how much they respect me for starting over. I was like, starting over? What do you mean starting over? And he made a really good point. He said, listen, you have 400,000 downloads per episode through podcast format. I'm like, right? And you have zero with the show on YouTube. Like, that's a great point. No subscribers, no viewers, and I never thought about that before. But it's a great reminder for all of you to say, <clears throat> when you're building something, it takes time. And it doesn't matter if you are a multimillionaire, it doesn't matter if you're a successful entrepreneur, if you're starting to build something from square one, you're starting from scratch. You got nothing. I got no shows, no subscribers, no viewers, and it takes time. It takes persistence, it takes consistency, it just takes dedication and passion to what you're doing. And I love what I'm doing, so I'm enjoying the process and the growth will come. If I'm enjoying myself, the growth will come. If I'm putting out good content, the growth will come. And it's a great reminder for everybody, especially if you're trying to build a body, build a business, launch a product, build a relationship. It doesn't matter, it just takes time. And so I just thought that was a great reminder, and I uh, very much appreciate it. And that came from uh, from Sar, Sar from uh, the Philippines. So thank you so much for that, Sar. Really appreciate you um, providing that new perspective to me, and gave me something to ponder out and something to uh, to share with all of you. But in any case, if you love this show, by the way, uh, definitely subscribe. Tell your friends, your family, your colleagues. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Subscribe on YouTube if you haven't yet. And, uh, of course, just tell me if you found me through the show. Tell me uh, what you think of the show and uh, how you've used it to help you in your life. In any case, let's crack into this week's book. So this week's book is um, one by Sarah Knight. And I'm not too sure how I feel about books that, I don't know, they try to go for the shock factor by swearing in the book title. I get it. I think it's kind of corny now. You just see it all the time. This book is called Get Your Shit Together, A No Fucks Given Guide. All right. Two swears, one in the title and in the subhead. I mean, there's a lot of books like that. Who else? Um, Mark Manson. Mark Manson's book. Um, what is it? The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. And there's one more I have. Where is... Ah, here we go. This one here. Uh... This one right here, Unfuck Yourself. Hilarious. Gary John Bishop. I'm going to get Gary on this show. I think he's an interesting cat, and I, I haven't read this book yet, but I definitely will. Obviously, you could tell just like nothing in here yet, but I'm going to give that one to read later on and get Gary on this show. But again, another book with some swears in it. I mean, whatever. It is what it is. Obviously, it's working for some people. They've done well for themselves. But regardless, this book in particular, it had some, it didn't really have a lot of depth to it, but it did provide us with some good stimulus to think about. Different things that maybe you're struggling with, that you might be having a difficult time with. And Sarah provides us with a couple of different techniques that we can use to maybe help us get over some of these common issues that we're having that might be holding us back. So I found a couple good takeaways from this. So I want to share them with you. And if you're having any challenges that are related to some of these takeaways, then it's going to add value to you immediately. So let us get right into this one. What do we have here? All right. First things first, let's crack into this one with golden nugget number one. Get your shit together by allocating time to achieving realistic goals. So I love this. Obviously, I love goals. I'm a huge fan of setting goals and far too many of us don't set goals. And for those of us who do set goals, Sarah argues that our goals are too lofty. They're too big. And I agree with that. 
I think if you're new to setting goals, you need to set realistic goals for yourself, right? You need to set smart goals, specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, time-bound. There's your realistic piece in there. But far too often, we're setting goals that are way too big. You know, we're rookies at goal setting, and yet we're setting goals like experts. It comes down to how you execute on it. Do you have the right discipline yet? Do you have the right skills to execute on that goal? So... What Sarah really pushes here, she really pushes the R here. Make it realistic. If you're setting a goal, chances are you're not achieving it. Whether it's a goal to uh, for New Year's resolution to lose weight, whether it's a savings goal, whether it's a relationship goal, whether it's a career goal, she's saying that far often too many of us are not achieving our goals. And I do not disagree with her. I think she's absolutely right. And I think she's right about that because we just don't know how to work at accomplishing our goals. So the takeaway here is to make them realistic. Make them easy to achieve. Make it so that it's not too difficult to to achieve your first goals. And as you get better at achieving goals, you're gonna build momentum. You're gonna start believing yourself. You're gonna start believing that change can happen in your life. But you'll never get there if you keep setting hard goals and you never achieve them. Eventually you're gonna say, this goal setting thing doesn't work. I, I don't believe this. So she says that she wants you to get your shit together by ditching your unrealistic goals. Get on track by aiming for realistic progress that will make a difference to your actual life, like losing a few pounds of weight. In other words, don't set goals based on other people's measurements, measurements you're unlikely to match. She wants you to set measurable goals for yourself, easy goals. So for example, if you're trying to lose weight, set a goal of losing five pounds. Once you've hit that goal, you're like, all right, I hit my goal. Far too often when you set your goal, you say, I want to lose 50 pounds. 50 pounds, that's a whole lot of weight and that's so far in the future. You're sitting there trying to figure out, well, how am I going to lose this weight? It's so far away, I can't do it. Screw it, I'm out. Don't do that. Set a goal of losing two pounds. Easy. If you're trying to create a savings goal for yourself, you know, you might say, listen, I want to save $10,000. That's so far in the future. You want instant gratification. You want to see some sort of progress now. So set a goal of saving 100 bucks by the end of the month. Did you achieve that goal? Perfect. Set another goal. 100 bucks next month. Achieve that goal. Perfect. Increase a little bit. $200. Take it baby steps. I forgot what movie that was. What movie was that with Bill Murray? I remember watching that as a kid where he would walk by and he had a, a obsessive compulsive disorder and it baby was steps. always like baby, baby steps. steps, just baby, baby steps. steps, just baby, baby steps. steps. I don't remember what that was. I'll have to look this baby one up steps. afterwards and, and put that in the video show. One little step at a time. <laughs> in any case, baby steps are key here when you're setting your goals. Don't set goals that are too high for yourself. Set realistic goals, set easy to achieve goals just to start building the process um, of you setting goals and achieving them. It'll help get your mind in the right spot. And I agree with Sarah on that takeaway. I actually really like that one. All right, this one's a cool one too. Golden nugget number two, maintain strong relationships through a strategy of competition. This one is so cool. I'm a big fan of this one. Real big fan. Let's just say you're trying to develop relationships with colleagues, with partners, with a new boyfriend, a girlfriend, um, your husband, your wife. You're trying to maintain long-term relationships. How do you keep that How do you keep that relationship strong? What do you do? Sarah has a great technique here that I actually really like, and I'm going to put this one into practice. This one's all about trying to compete with the other person that you're trying to build a relationship with. You're going to look at this like a competition, and not an unhealthy competition where you say, I beat you, I'm better than you. No, you set a competition where it says, I know what you're doing for me, but I'm going to try to one-up you. So for example... You're going to find pleasure in doing the little things then. For example, cleaning the dishes, sweeping the floor. Um, If your spouse, if your boyfriend or your girlfriend, um, if they're, you know, cleaning the kitchen, you're going to clean the kitchen and vacuum because you're like, I'm going to try to beat you. Your partner is going to see this and they're going to say, wow, this person's giving it extra effort, right? If somebody gives, if one of your spouses or your boyfriend, your girlfriend goes over and they give you a hug, you're going to give them a hug, you're going to give them a kiss, and you're going to tell them a little something extra. Tell them how much you appreciate them. You're always going to try and outdo your partner when it comes to your relationship. And I like that. I like that a lot. Maybe you think creating this competition might be a little bit unhealthy, but it's in, it's in good spirit and you can see where it's going. 
You're trying to give more of yourself, every single opportunity you can to your partner. And that's a good thing. And hopefully they see that, they reciprocate. Or they see that, they feel, and they say, wow, I feel so loved. Because Sarah argues that we need to get our shit together when it comes to relationships. She says that we so often think that it's the big things. Right? It's like, oh, I have to get something really big for the anniversary. I have to get something really big for the birthday or, or what have you. And it's not about the big things. It's about the small things, the small everyday things. It's not even about getting flowers. It's about making the bed, maybe writing a little note. Maybe it's about just sending a nice little text message throughout the day. Maybe it's finding a nice quote on Google and just sending it to them once in a while just to know, show them that, that you care. Create a competition. Or get into a competition with your spouse, with your boyfriend, with your girlfriend. And try and outdo each other all the time with how much you guys love each other. I think that's a great way to get your shit together with regards to your relationship. I don't know about you, but what do you think about that? Do you, do you think it's healthy? Do you like it? Personally, I like it. I think it's a great takeaway. And I think it's something that all of us can do very easily. And we'll find a lot of pleasure in doing the mundane things like dusting or vacuuming or something like that, where maybe it's not so fun to do. But if we're trying to make it into a competition and say, listen, I'm going to do things that my spouse really enjoys, maybe like a clean house. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later on, actually, about keeping the house clean. But if they enjoy keeping the house clean, then you're going to do more to do that. And you're going to find pleasure in doing it because all you're trying to do is stay in a competition. You're trying to stay uh, ahead of them. So interesting takeaway. I like that. Get into a competition with your spouse in terms of how much you can give to the spouse. And hopefully they can give it back to you in return. All right. Golden nugget number three. Get your professional shit together by exuding confidence and asking the right questions. So now when you're in your career... You are, maybe you're new to an industry. Maybe you're new to a company. Maybe you necessarily haven't found your voice yet. Sarah argues that to find your, your place in the organization, to get your shit together, you have to start exuding confidence. Fake it before you make it. And that's crucial. Because she says that you should look at the other people in the boardroom, other people in the organization who look like they have their shit together. What do they look like? Like, do they look like they're dressed nice or do they still have yesterday's lunch sitting on their shirt? Do they have wrinkles all over their shirt? Do they sit up straight in the boardroom? Do they look confident? Or do they kind of like sit here meek and, you know, not really sure what to say? Do they kind of keep their eyes down or do they sit up straight, look forward, you know, pen in their hand kind of thing, power stance, you know, make direct eye contact. What do they look like? Exude confidence through your body language. We know this. We've talked about this before. Your physiology determines your psychology. How you hold yourself, how you carry yourself will determine how you feel. That's why they say when you're feeling down, when you're not feeling great, try smiling. Just try smiling. Be a a goofball. Sit in the car and just try smiling. Now, when you do, just don't turn your head over and start looking at somebody and start smiling. They're going to think you're a murderer. They're going to think you're crazy. Just kind of do it to to yourself in your office. But just by smiling, it's going to make you feel better. By holding your shoulders back, head held high. Why did I do that? It's like I have a whole bunch of flowing hair. Yeah, I wish. I wish. But your body language will determine how you start to feel. And the more you do that, the better you'll feel. I've talked about this before. When I first started my career, I would look for my power poses, right? The Superman pose where I'd hold my hands like this on my hips. Or, for example, if I was walking to a meeting, I'd make sure that I would pretend that I had a flowing cape behind my back. And it was my job to keep that cape up. So I had to walk with purpose. I had to keep my shoulders back. I had to walk with my head held high and pretend I had that cape back. And man, I was walking with confidence. And I felt good when I got into the boardroom. And I kept that going by getting to another powerful stance. So exude confidence through body language, through eye contact, having your voice a little bit higher. So that's one way. The other one is asking the right questions. So by getting your professional shit together... By asking the right questions, that's going to actually enable you to understand where you need to go, where you need to put your effort, and even if this organization's right for you. So Sarah suggests that we ask our boss, our superior, what we need to do better in order to succeed, what we need to do in order to get that promotion, what we need to do in order to get that bonus. Because she argues that far too many of us are guessing our way through our careers and we're assuming 
We're assuming that we know what our boss wants of us. And by assuming, we're not taking direct action or we're not going directly at the task as we should be. Or maybe we're taking action on things that maybe our bosses are saying, I don't know why you're doing that. If you just did X, Y, and Z instead of A, B, and C, you'd be in a much better position or you'd be much more effective at your job. So I'm a big fan of that, actually. By asking questions, we're going to enable ourselves to get much better at, um, at achieving our objectives in our organization. And the last thing here, I almost forgot about this one. If you ask questions and your boss says, there's nothing you can do to get that promotion. There's nothing you can do to get that bonus. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to achieve that goal. At that point, when you ask that question, at least you're going to know there's no opportunity for you to move up. At least you're going to know there's no opportunity for you to get that bonus. At least you've learned that maybe your boss isn't believing you. And that's power as well. Because now you say, okay, there's no opportunity for me to move up. Maybe I need to go and look elsewhere in order to move up in this organization. Because I'm taking control of my career. I'm taking control of my life. And if I can't get to where I want in this organization, I need to go to another organization that will give me what I want. So that's a great takeaway from Sarah, very tactical, but something that I think all of us should definitely put in place. Whether you're an entrepreneur or freelancer and you're working with your client, ask them the same question. What does success look like for you? How can I make this a 10 out of 10 experience for you? I ask that question all the time to my clients. What does success look like for you? And if you're in a job, it's how can I be successful in this role? What is it specifically that I can do to be at a 10 out of 10 in your mind? Get specific on that. When you get that specific answer, then you can execute on that. And that's going to make you more successful in your job. And as Sarah says, help you get your professional shit together. All right. Golden nugget number four. This one's a tough one. I'll share it with you, but I'll share my perspective as well. Golden Golden nugget number four says, get your health shit together by prioritizing and harnessing the power of negative thinking. Ooh, there's the word right there. Negative thinking. Whenever you're talking negative thinking, I don't want to hear any bit of it. I just don't. Oh man, this juice. So tart. It's good for you, but man, it's just, as soon as I do, it's like when you take a, a little bit of like when you suck on a lemon or a lime or you get one of those like sour candies, all of a sudden your mouth just just gets sucked up. Craziness. Anyways, I digress. We're talking about health. We're talking about negative thinking here. So she argues that um, millions of Americans, Canadians, people around the world, Australians, people who live in the UK, Africa, everyone, everyone around the world is starting to get overweight. We're starting to get less healthy. We're not eating nutrient rich foods. And as a result, our health is suffering. And I agree. And so she says that for the most part, society in general believes that we don't care about our health. She argues it's not true. She says that it's not true because if you look at this, diets, people love talking about diets. Diets are an all-time high, right? You're talking about the keto diet. Um, Way back in the day, you're talking about Adkins diet, vegan diets, You know, there's so many different diets and different things you can do. People are big into kombucha or whatever, cold-pressed juices, what have you. So people are interested in health, but they're still not achieving their goals. This goes back to golden nugget number one, where it's setting realistic goals. That's something you can do to help get your health shit together. So she says that people do care about their health. They're just not doing anything to improve their health. And so one of the techniques, here's where I'm going to debate this one. One of the techniques she shares is to look at your current circumstance. If you look at your body and you're like, oh man, I got too much, too much fat on my body and I feel really negative about how I feel. I don't like how I look in the mirror. I don't like how I feel. You feel very negative about it. Then she says, look at going to the gym. Compare how you feel now about your body to the gym. Which one is worse? Going in the gym and sweating for a couple hours or sitting here for the rest of your life looking at your, 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 your body in a state that you're not happy with. She says, look at the negativity and let the negativity drive you. And I guess that works. She wants you to focus on the negativity, focus on how crappy you feel, and then look at the alternative. The alternative is, well, I can get better by going in the gym. And that's far less negative. The pain of that is far less than the pain of staying the same. Right? So that's her technique to get us going. 
Ah, uh, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? Personally, I don't like that one. I just don't. I'm not for that because that puts your mind in a negative state. When you start feeding your mind with negative energy, with negative thoughts, you feel it on your body. And so to get yourself out of that, it takes a Herculean effort. It takes true discipline. And if you're in that state, you're not really at a point where you have a high level of discipline. And I'll tell you, I'm extremely disciplined, extremely disciplined. But if I start to feel really bad about myself, start to feel really negative about something, I just sit and I stew. And that's me, bubbly freaking Ryan. If you're not used to putting yourself in a, in a positive state of mind, like I'm the guy who created Creature 8, where I'm putting myself in an optimistic, enthusiastic, powerful state every single day. And I have a tough time when I'm feeling negative. So I don't think that putting yourself in a negative circumstance and thinking about how bad I feel and stewing that is going to force me to change. It's just not. So that's Sarah's approach to doing that, and I don't like it. I would much rather set a small goal, like she suggested in the very beginning, and say, listen, my goal, this month, I want to lose two pounds. Realistic goal, easy to hit. When I hit the goal, I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to go buy myself, you know, a new whatever. I'm going to go buy myself a new new piece of clothing or whatever. I'm going to go enjoy myself, you know, a, a nice dinner, for example, a nice healthful dinner. Set a nice small term goal or focus on the positive, right? Focus on the positive of, of trying to, actually, we talked about this last week, right? Creating good habits. Set yourself up for success by only allowing yourself to listen to a podcast or watch a show while you go to the gym. Find a reason to get excited about going to the gym. Set a goal that gets you excited. Maybe your goal is, listen, I'm going to go get myself a $1,000 shopping spree at uh, Victoria's Secret. Um, Or I'm going to go get myself a $1,000 shopping spree at, um, I don't know, where do men shop? I don't know. I have to get all my stuff custom because my shoulders are too big. My waist is too small. My butt's too big. So I don't really know where men shop. I don't know. Where are men shop? Uh, Mark's Work Warehouse. Sure. Harry Rosen. Whatever. You're going to get yourself some custom shirts done. Right? That sounded really funny that I went straight to Victoria's Secret, but I don't know where men shop. That's mm, very interesting. But anyways, because I have to get all my stuff custom. That's why I just I have a very strange kickboxing body. It's ridiculous. But anyways, set yourself a goal that gets you excited. Do as we suggested last week. Only allow yourself to listen to your favorite podcast or watch your favorite shows while you're at the gym. Focus on more positive, not negative. I'm not too sure what you think about Sarah's technique here about stewing in the negativity, feeling negative about your current situation and comparing that to the negativity of going to the gym. If the negativity of staying the same is worse than the negativity of change, then it's going to spur you on. I don't necessarily follow that. Maybe you do. I don't know. Let me know what your thoughts are. Me, I'd much rather double down on something that's more positive and putting my mind in a more positive state of mind and building that habit over time. I don't know. What do you think though? Am I a little bit off base? Is there maybe some, uh, is there maybe some, I don't know. Is there something there to that technique? Maybe there is. Maybe there isn't. I don't know. But I'm interested in hearing what you have to say. All right. Golden nugget number five. Get your shit together by coping with anxiety, by being proactive or strategically doing nothing at all. Now, obviously, anxiety is something that I take very seriously. Because a lot of my clients, when they're trying to create their eight every day, anxiety is a real emotion that they're feeling. They feel anxiety and it, it, it overwhelms them. It takes over their entire existence and they have a very difficult time getting up in the morning because their anxiety is so, so strong. It's got such a strong grasp on them. And so there's two things here. The anxiety is caused by fear. Fear of taking action or fear of the consequences of taking action. So Sarah suggests here two approaches to dealing with your anxiety and getting your shit together. The first one is by proactively taking action on the thing that's causing you anxiety, taking action on the thing that's causing you fear. So for example, if you want to move out of your best friend's house and you want to move in with a new roommate, you may be feeling very anxious about that because you don't want to lose a friend. They're a good friend. You don't want to upset them. They thought you're going to be there for a long time. By leaving, it's going to put them in a very uncomfortable position. They need the money too. You're feeling bad about it. What she's saying is you have to rip the Band-Aid off. You have to just suck it up and go and talk to them. 
because the pain of you just waiting and thinking about it over and over and over again is going to do more damage to you than if you just went over there, ripped the bandage off. It's going to be painful, but at least you're going to get it out of the way and then you can begin to heal afterwards. That's a simple example. There might be numerous examples. Maybe you want to quit your job, but you feel guilty. Maybe you're trying to tell your spouse something, but you feel scared to tell them. Maybe you want to have a conversation with your kid, but you're a little too scared to have that conversation. I don't know what it is exactly for you, but one way to deal with your anxieties is to just face the fear and go and do it. One thing I find always helps, and it works quite frequently, is when I get my blood pumping, when I go for a workout, my, my, my heart's pumping, my blood's flowing, my lungs are going, my brain's activated. It's very easy to get past fear when you're in that elevated state. So oftentimes things that are making me anxious, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go do this. But before I do it, I'm going to go for a workout and then I'm going to go do it. Get my mind into a peak state. And when my mind's at a peak state, I feel confident. I feel at my best. I'm at my most courageous. And now I'm going to go deal with the issue. I'm going to go rip that bandage off. Those little takeaway for you that you might want to use if you have something that's causing anxiety in your life and you want to go deal with it. Maybe get some physical activity. Get that blood flowing. Get that mind activated. Get those heart, that heart bringing new oxygen in your body. Maybe that's one way to deal with it. The second way that Sarah says that you can deal with your anxiety is actually doing nothing at all. And so you might say, well, hold on a second. That's kind of counterproductive to what you just said. It is and it isn't. Take, for example, you got an email. An email from your boss. And the email came across kind of snooty. You know, or maybe it wasn't an email. Maybe your boss said something to you that uh, just rubs you the wrong way. Maybe your spouse rubs you the wrong way. Maybe your child says something that really offended you and made you really upset to the point of tears. It's going to happen. Or maybe it has happened. You can either go and deal with it right there, rip the bandage off, but the problem is the emotion is raw. The emotion is raw, and you, if you're approaching something with a high degree of emotion, you know your IQ actually drops. When you start to get angry and you get into an argument with somebody, your IQ drops significantly. So Sarah's providing a uh, different perspective here and saying, listen, if something got you anxious, something upset you, maybe just wait for it to cool down. And then tomorrow, maybe then you deal with it. Or maybe tomorrow you don't have to deal with it at all because that person came by and they're like, listen, I'm, I'm sorry. I was in such a bad mood yesterday. I didn't mean what I said. I apologize. Sometimes just giving a little bit of space and allowing the other person to just calm down, it might bring a resolution to the problem. But the big takeaway here is is don't go into something emotional. It's not good for you. It's not good for the person. It's not good for your mindset. It's not good for the, the, the resolution to the problem or whatever it is. So if you're dealing with some sort of anxiety because there's something lingering over you, either one, rip the bandage off, get it out of the way, or two, wait strategically to take that bandage off. Wait for things to cool down and maybe you'll get lucky enough where the person will realize the wrong that they've done and they'll come to you and they'll apologize afterwards. So some interesting takeaways from Sarah there and I like both of those. Just two different things that you can use to deal with anxiety. And last but not least, golden nugget number six. This is one that's just, oh, it's so important to me. I love a clean house. The golden nugget number six is get your shit together by dividing chores into 20 minute sessions. Obviously, she realizes that keeping a clean house, a clean bedroom, clean bathroom, whatever, clean garage, clean basement is really important. And it's something that people deal with. It's something that people have a difficult time with, keeping their house clean. How often do you clean your house? You clean your house every week, every couple weeks, and you clean it. You look at it, you're like, man, everything looks so good. But then a couple days later, you look and you're like, what happened? It's a disaster zone. Like, I just cleaned this. And you freak out. You're ripping your hair. Well, my hair, ripping my hair out. <laughs> that happens all the time. And Sarah realized that. So she's saying, listen, get your shit together with regards to cleaning your house. And here's how you do it. Separate all the main chores into different categories. Cleaning the toys. If you have children or you have dogs. I have dogs. I have all this dog toys sitting in my office floor here for Roxy. I love it though. I have no problem with that. It's my office. I'll do what I want with it. Um, Divide them into categories, right? So toys, uh, vacuuming, bathrooms, kitchen, divide it all up into different categories. And once you develop them into categories, set up times or days every single week and you have to schedule it out. 
Monday, I'm going to clean the bathrooms. Tuesday, I'm going to clean the kitchen. Um, Wednesday, I'm going to do the vacuuming. You know, Thursday, I'm going to do the dusting. Whatever. Friday, I'm going to do the garbages. Whatever it is, break them into categories and separate them into 20-minute chunks throughout the week. And just create a new habit out of cleaning the house. And the reason she's saying that is because it's much easier to do these things every day or every other day, for example, or once a week, rather than just have one big day where you spend four or five hours on cleaning the house. Because that's not enjoyable. It takes so much time. But it's much easier if you just dedicate 20 minutes to cleaning something. Right? I think with the kitchen, it's a little bit different. The kitchen's got to be cleaned every single day. So maybe the kitchen is something that you add on to everything else. Right, So um, the kitchen is continuous Monday to Sunday. But then throughout Monday to Sunday, you also add on one more thing. Vacuuming the floors, dusting, cleaning the bathrooms, whatever. The kitchen's always got to be clean. I hate a, a dirty kitchen. When I'm cooking, I got to make sure I'm cleaning the kitchen while I'm cooking because I just love a clean kitchen. When I get my meal, I want to enjoy my meal without having to turn around and look at, you know, my dirty kitchen. Don't want to do that. I got to have a nice clean kitchen. So for me, this one's really important and it's a great technique, a great takeaway to always do. Now, this is something I've been doing for a long time. I just clean all the time. All the time, I vacuum every single, well, not every single day. I dust the floors maybe like twice a week. I vacuum once a week, clean the kitchen every single day, the bathrooms once a week. You know, so I kind of got that system set up. But this is one way to make cleaning your house a little bit easier. And you know what they say, cleanliness brings purity to the mind. When you have a whole bunch of clutter everywhere, you start to feel cluttered. Your mind starts to feel cluttered. And so by cleaning your house, you just feel better. And that's so important. So I found it very interesting she wanted to put that in the book. But I kind of like it because I believe in that. Cleanliness brings purity to life. I remember hearing that so long ago when I was a kid and I never forgot that to this day. But all right, my friends, that is a wrap for today. That is Get Your Shit Together. No fuck, a no fucks given guide. Man, I just it's so uncomfortable having so many swears in there. I just don't like it. Anyways, it's by Sarah Knight. Let me know what you thought about this book. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Are there certain takeaways in here that are going to help you create your aid? Are there certain takeaways in here that are going to help you build resilience? I don't know. There might be something in here that really resonated with you. Maybe there wasn't. If there wasn't, then come back next week. Maybe I'll have another book for you that will help build resilience, that will help you create your aid. Maybe there'll be something in there that's going to better resonate with you. But if you did love this episode, then please go online, especially if you're listening on an Apple device, rate and review the show. Go to the podcast app, go to shows, find the Cut the Crap show, hit the Cut the Crap show, and scroll up a little bit, and uh, preferably give me five stars. I'd greatly appreciate that. Also, don't forget to connect with me online, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Catch this show on YouTube. Subscribe, like, comment, share the show. That's going to mean a lot to me. And of course, I haven't done this uh, pitch for a little while here, this, this call to action. But again, I love helping animals. Cats, dogs, like, they're in my heart, man. I, I love them so much. And anything that I can do to help them, anything I can do to support them, I'm going to do. You know, whether it's helping them through surgeries, helping them through with food, um, helping them with medications, helping them with whatever things I can do, whether it's just keeping the light on for these shelters, I'm going to do it. So I put the ask out there to um, the Cut the Crap Show Nation to donate $5 every single month to the charities that I'm supporting which are local dog shelters, dog and cat shelters. And I love this because pets help people create their aid every day. I've seen it. I've seen it with my own family. I see it with my, my mom and my dad. And I see how Roxy brings so much joy to them. And I don't see this just in my situation, but so many other people as well. And uh, I really love animals. So it's one of those things that I'm really passionate about. If you want to support that, you could support me through the show, which I then go ahead and I support these other causes. And it's because of all of us together we're able to do that. And there's so many of you who have already donated $5 a month to this. Go to the CutTheCrapShow.com, hit the red button at the very top, and you can donate $5 a month through Patreon. $5 is the price of a cup of coffee or two cups of coffee, wherever you get your coffee from. But that money goes a long way, especially when we're a community donating that money into a big pool. And um, we're just doing so much to change people's lives. And uh, I just want to keep that going. So if you want to be a part of that, then by all means, please join uh, Please join the, um, the Cut the Crap Nation Army or whatever you want to call it, how corny that sounds. But we can all make change together. And that's one way we can do it. So thank you so much to all of you who have already donated, who continue to donate, and for all of those who uh, will donate in the future. 
But all right, that is a wrap for this week. So thank you so much for joining me on this week's episode of the Cut the Crap Show. And I'll be back here next week and have a brand new book, brand new golden nuggets. And uh, every single week, you know what I'm doing here. Just trying to save you time, bring you information that will spark change in your life. And uh, just trying to help you build resilience and help you create your aid every single week. Have a fantastic, productive, inspired weekend, everybody. Weekend? Week. Don't just leave it at the weekend. Have a great week, everybody. My God. Anyways, have a good one, everyone. Bye.